Hi, I'm Mike Cloudon, uh, CEO of the Milken Institute, and I want to welcome each and all of you to this uh, wonderful forum. We're delighted that you could join us today uh, and uh, come in out of the beautiful sunshine uh, to uh, have your minds enlightened uh, as much as they would be outside from the rays of the sun. We've got uh, uh, a wonderful uh, event today with wonderful Karen Feinerman in discussion with the equally wonderful Jody Miller. Uh, before we get to that, let me just mention we're in the middle of a very busy fall here at the Institute. We just finished our uh, third uh, London Summit last week uh, where we had uh, a thousand people. Uh, my colleagues at our Faster Cures team in Washington are preparing for our fifth Partnering for Cures meeting, which is going to be held in New York the first week in November. Um, here, in, uh, here in this room in Santa Monica, we're going to be holding our next forum on Thursday, October 24th. It's David and Tom Kelly of the legendary Silicon Valley uh, design firm IDEO, and they're going to be talking about their new book, Creative Confidence, Unleashing the Potential Within All of Us. Then we also have two invitation-only events for our associates and young leaders. We're putting it on with our friends at RAND. Uh, the former New York, New Mexico Governor Bill Richardson will be here at the Institute on October 25th. Nobel Prize winning economist Edmund Phelps of Columbia is going to be at uh, RAND on November 6th. Uh, and if you're interested in attending, of course, you will want to join the associates, and you can ask uh, someone here at the Institute about that. Uh, now, on to the, uh, the event that brought you here today. Uh, let me just mention that after uh, we're through with our talk and questions, you'll be able to purchase uh, the book at the table over there. There are a copy of Karen's book, and uh, she's uh, graciously agreed to stay and sign copies. Uh, there are also going to be time for questions. And uh, we're going to encourage all of you to either text or email questions during the talk to the numbers that are going to be shown on the screen. Uh, then we'll share as many of those as we can with Karen and Jody. For those of you who either do not have electronic devices or don't know how to use them, I suggest you borrow a pencil and paper or take one out, write down your question, and hand it to somebody by you who has an electronic device. Uh, so we, we think by doing it that way, we can get through more questions and have a great discussion. So now I'm delighted to introduce Jody Miller. She's going to lead today's discussion with Karen. Jody is a founder and CEO of Business Talent Group, a leader in bringing top talent for firms for consulting and project work. She's been a venture capitalist, the COO of Disney's interactive TV joint venture. She was special assistant to President Bill Clinton. She's a noted expert and frequent commentator on the future of work, including a recent piece in the Wall Street Journal on the real women's issue, time. And she's been a frequent uh, visitor here at the Milken Institute, a good friend. We're delighted to welcome her and to introduce our speaker, Jody Miller. Thank you. Are we, uh, can everyone hear us? So it's always wonderful to be at the Milken Institute, and I really appreciate uh, the opportunity, particularly because the Milken Institute didn't realize it when they asked me to do this, that I actually know Karen. And not only am I a fan of her work, um, but I actually gave her an engagement party over, we're not going to say how many years ago, but yes. many, many double-digit <laughs> years ago. Um, Karen was introduced to me through her now husband, who was a, a friend of mine in Washington. And we were just reminiscing uh, a little bit. And I was remembering that um, we had looked for, I was a White House fellow, her husband was a White House fellow a few years after me. And um, we were both looking for places to live in Washington at the same time. And, I found this very lovely apartment that I was very excited about moving into. And Lawrence found a very grand home that was huge. And he said, you know, I don't have any furniture. And you have a lot of furniture, so why don't we swap? And before I knew it, I was in this big house. And he had this lovely apartment, which he then told me he had a new girlfriend who he was going to ask to furnish it. And that's how I met Karen um, many, many years ago. And it's just um, really exciting to be here with her. As you all know, she's the author of Feynman's Rules, Secrets I'd Only Tell My Daughters About Business and Life. She's also a very rare breed, a uh, woman CEO and founder of a very successful hedge fund. And she is the chairwoman on CNBC. She is also the wife of a pretty extraordinary guy, too. And 
the mother of four children. So we're going to talk about a lot of things today, um, both her work and some of her advice. And, you know, I have to say that when I started thinking about all the things you've done and um, when I think about the, the breadth of experiences you've had in your life, it reminded me of something that one of your mother's role models, Jackie, um, used to talk about. And she had a, a definition of happiness, which she actually uh, took from her husband, the president, um, who used to talk about the Greek definition of happiness. And I'm going to read it to you. It is that happiness is the exercise of vital powers along lines of excellence in a life affording them scope. And when you look at your life, it's hard for me to believe, based on this definition, that you're not a very, very happy person, um, that you have really accomplished so much on so many dimensions. And the first question I have for you is, you've written a book that is very honest, very personal. With all that you have going on in your life, why was this the right time to write a book like this? Uh, first, let me say I'm, I'm so happy to be here with you. It's just so funny that we ended up doing this together. Uh, and this is my first time at the Milken Institute, and uh, my Uncle Ralph has been involved a long time and happy to be here. Um, why was this the right time? As it turned out, it wasn't, but I didn't know that going in. I didn't know there's never the right time to write a book, apparently. It really just sort of takes over your, your whole life. It's a tremendous burden, and some people say it's a labor of love, and I thought it was awful, and uh, <laughs> I mean, it really, really was. And it looks was. like you really wrote it. Oh, I wrote it. I mean, it. I can, I know I, your voice, and yes, I can hear you. Yes, I wanted to get yes. my voice out, and I just, I felt like I was sort of at a point in my career where I felt like I had something to say, where um, my daughters were sort of getting to be of an age that maybe it might be relevant for them, but, but I don't think they're so into it, to tell you the truth. But they, that I felt like, <laughs> I mean, I, a lot of times people say, oh, you're a woman in business or a woman on Wall Street. And I, and I thought a lot about being, am I just a person in business? And I thought, no, I'm a woman in business. It's different. It is very different to be a woman. And what do I wish I had known? Mm -hmm. What do I think I know now that I wish I had known? So let's start um, with your career. What drew okay. you to Wall Street? Money. OK. OK. <laughs> Money and, uh -huh. um, you know, Oh, you're looking for something a little broader? No, I'm going to actually, I actually have a question about money, but it's not okay. until page seven. I'm only oh, page three. Okay. So you, like Karen suggests, I'm very prepared. I, you know, if you read her finer points, she talks about how you prepare for uh, public speaking. So I uh, became especially prepared today. But um, no, money I get. Was it because you wanted to be personally, financially secure? Was it because you wanted to compete with the men? because it was a w an area that women were not very prevalent. Uh -huh. What about it grabbed you? Honestly, the first thing really was the money, and I, because I really felt that money was power. That lesson became clear to me um, very, very early on. Uh, at, at the beginning of the book, I talk about my mother's Calvinist philosophy. And it, honestly, this is verbatim from my mother, she said, I buy my girls, and there were four girls and a boy, Calvin Klein clothes, so that's all they know. And then when they graduate college, they got to figure out how to pay for them themselves. <laughs> that's it. That is the Calvinist philosophy. <laughs> and really, I can't tell you how many people think Calvinism is just something else entirely <laughs> different than that. But I, so sh the message was, make your own money. Be, be independent. Have power. And, and so the clearest route for power, for money, was Wall Street. Mm -hmm. And so there was no doubt. At 15, I knew I was going to be a risk arbitrager. You did. And so how did I you just, even find out? What the, how did I, they get on your radar screen? I, one day, I read an article about Ivan Boeski, was how I thought <laughs> you pronounced his name, because I'd never heard it. Uh, and uh, he was a risk arbitrager. This was before he was convicted of insider trading. And I thought, wow, that seems fascinating. And he's, it's so exciting. And there's so much going on. And wow, he's making a bunch of money, and that's what I want to do. And I wanted it with a focus. I say, like, like a teenage girl wants to be a fashion designer. I wanted to be a risk arbitrager. So mm. William Ackman mm. this Sunday was in, uh, interviewed in the New York Times Magazine. I don't know if you had a chance to I, look at I it. didn't. I, I know Bill, yeah. And, you know, he's one of the major activist investors. I mean, one of the questions I have for you is when you look, see all the major activist investors lined up, there are no women. There are no women. And we should talk about that because uh -huh. I think being an activist investor sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. And I don't know why you don't have more women in there. But uh -huh. he said, he talked about 
how you had to be unemotional when you invest. And of course, it was important for him to say this because he just lost $500 million on J.C. Penney, so right. he has to be very unemotional about this. Uh -huh. And he has to have a thick skin. And those are two qualities you don't often associate naturally with women in business. Very true. And, and I know I, you agree with these. I know you talk about this in your yes. book, the need to be unemotional about investing. Right. So how did you get yourself there? Uh, you know, it's, it was trial and error, and I just, I, he's so right about those two things, and I try to think about what can women learn from men? What do men do better? Because they do seem to advance better. I don't think necessarily they're smarter on average, but yet they, they do a lot of things that help them advance. And what is it? And I think being unemotional is one of them. And I think that women give themselves, they view their emotional intelligence and their intuitiveness and all of that as a huge attribute, and they give it too much room to allow their emotions to sort of take over when other things need to, I think. So the men have that ability to compartmentalize that we might find so aggravating in our husbands, <laughs> but it's really important. And I know Bill does not, he has the thickest skin. It doesn't matter. It's just water off a duck's back. He doesn't care. I do. I would never, do, we've done small scale activist investing, never in the, in the way that he would do it. And you think, wow, that guy, is, he's got a lot, I don't know what it is, chutzpah, is it confidence, it's everything mixed in. It makes him successful, sometimes it makes him not successful. Right. I, I know very few women who were willing to be as out there as he is. And I wonder if a, a male-dominated board of directors would respond in a different way. I have to assume they would. How that's could they really, not? That's really interesting. I, I serve on the board of two public companies, and I think an activist investor would be wonderful because if, you know, I heard David Einhorn speak, whom some uh -huh. of you may know, Greenlight Capital, who's probably one of the most successful Absolutely. Uh, activist investors. Mm -hmm. He's the person who initially got. Um, Apple to cough up money, and now, of course, uh, Icon's trying to get cough up more money, but very successful guy, young guy in his early 40s, mm -hmm. and, you know, I heard him speak, and he was so persuasive. What he, said to, what he said was, you know, I don't know why these companies are upset when I come in. It's like getting $2 million worth of free consulting. They hire McKinsey. Mm -hmm. I wish they would hire BTG, but they hire McKinsey, most of them, and, you know, why aren't they just listening to me when I'm trying to help them do better? And I thought it was very compelling. Uh -huh. And yes. I think a woman as an activist investor would act with the same message would actually be very effective. It just, it, you know. Yes, I, I could see it. I could see it. And if you look at the difference of the style between Bill and David, David is more, uh, he, he's, he, he, he comes off much more humble. Yes. And, then, and it's not as much sort of in your face as Bill. Right. And um, so. David, I think, tries to move a little more behind the scenes. Um, and I think a, maybe a woman could do it with a, with a not an in-your-face kind of style, but a um, let them think it's their idea kind of style. <laughs> That's that could really, so, you know, you don't need the so credit. You, you, you can get a lot done. You, you've talked <laughs> in your book about your best trade and your worst trade. And yeah. I think it's important for people to understand that most of your career has been as a trader. Yeah. An investor. Mm -hmm. And again, there are not many women who do that. And you have a fund, Metropolitan mm -hmm. Capital, which is you know, very successful. Mm -hmm. Why don't you talk a little bit about your worst trade and your best trade and what you learned from them? Worst trade. Why don't we talk about your worst prom date or something? Right. I know. Just to go I know. back to the painful. Yes. Um, well, I thought your worst yeah, trade no, was no. kind of interesting. It is. You know? I mean, I have so many worst trades. I don't want to take up your whole day. But um, <laughs> there was one trade that really was particularly educational um, in, it, in its, it was so bad. And what it was was a, um, the fine points of it aren't that important, but United Airlines was in a deal to be taken over in an LBO and they, the stock was 280 and the deal was gonna be 300 once it all came together. And we owned a bunch of stock. And I put on a trade that would hedge our position in case the deal were delayed. So if for those of you who are really in the weeds, I put on a one by two put spread, I paid two and a half bucks. If you don't know what that means, it doesn't matter. What happened was the deal wasn't delayed. The deal broke entirely. 
So the stock went from 280, ultimately it stopped at uh, 160 or 180 on its way down to 80. So this trade that I paid two and a half dollars for, that I thought in, my, in the best case scenario would be worth 20, turned out to be worth negative 80. So you pay two and a half, I know, thank you, thank you, it makes <laughs> you feel really good. So you pay two and a half, and then you pay 80 on top of it to get out. That's a terrible trade. It is the worst trade of my career. I hope for the rest of my career it remains the worst trade I've ever done. And it was all because I couldn't see the possibility of the deal breaking. That is, it, 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 that's not such a brilliant thought to think, wow, maybe this deal of this very over-levered company after yeah. a big economic boom, maybe things don't go the right way. It was so stupid that I didn't even allow for that possibility, didn't even factor it in. And, and put on a amount of risk that I had no idea how big it was. So that was a very important, important lesson about understanding risk, or at least knowing if you don't even know how much risk you're taking on. It was a terrible, terrible trade. I've made many other bad trades, but that one sticks out and will always. Well, and, and it's it. interesting, and one of the things Ackman said is that, you know, any trade can go bad. And you know probably may go bad, mm -hmm. and so the ability to be resilient, to understand that you're not going to win 100 percent, is also I think a pretty important characteristic for what you do. Yes, but I think one of the other things that I also learned was sometimes selling something at a small loss is the absolute best trade you can make because every big loss we've had started off as a small loss, and then we rationalized why it was still really good or. Right. why any information that was counter to our thesis wasn't really relevant. A lot of investors do that and, uh, and sort of their ego gets involved and they can't be wrong. They think, I can't be wrong. I can't sell it now because that's admitting defeat. And that's one thing I think women do better is they have less ego wrapped up and they can say, you know what? I was wrong. We're out. Done. Right. So since you had to talk about your worst mm -hmm. trade, tell us about the best one. So the best one we ever had was a mix of some smart thinking on our part and some luck and a little bit of the black swan to the upside. And this was a trade, it was called Golar. And what we were trying to do was find a vehicle to express a bet in our belief that natural gas would be used more around the world. Uh, it was clean, it was a lot of reasons. But so we tried to find the right way to do it. We didn't want to invest in a production of natural gas facility because lots of things could go wrong. We didn't want to invest in the price of natural gas because you could have tons of it and it trade down. But we found that if you invested in tankers that move natural gas, the price would only depend on the amount of natural gas looking to be moved around the world. And that was a really good way to play it. So as these markets developed, and it's a very different market, natural gas here, than in Asia, the demand for these tankers really went up a lot, and since there were so few of them, day rates just went up and up and up, even though the cost of moving this doesn't move, so the margins get huge. And then, out of nowhere, this black swan event of Fukushima happened. Japan shut down their nuclear power and switched to all natural gas. And the demand for these tankers, which had been for $20,000 a day, went up to $100,000 a day. And the, the bottom line, uh, you know, margin expansion right. was just extraordinary. So that's a good day. Yeah, that was a good one. We can tell that again later. <laughs> <laughs> so you talk about the fact that five of the six top people in your company are women. Yeah. And it's by design. Yeah. Now, our company is about mm -hmm. the same. We are top, most of our top people are women, too, although I would say it's probably less by design. Why do you want women at the top of your firm? I like working with women. I like promoting women. Um, I like I, women are more loyal. I found just to make generalizations that it could uh, come back to haunt me. Um, <laughs> more uh, there's there's less ego. Um, and. I don't know. I find there, there's, there's less politics. Mm -hmm. I found, even though their perception is that women get caught up with that, I, I haven't found that to be the case. And yet, your mentor mm -hmm. was a man. A man. 
and was very important to your yes. forming the hedge fund. Right. And he and I started together. And the reason I think women need in, women in fields that are male dominated need a male mentor is because it's just math. There are more men. Find a man. Yeah. And find a man who has children, preferably girls. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, I mean, I'm glad you're laughing, but it wasn't meant to be funny. True, yeah. they, you know, I think they see their daughter, and and, and that, that can really be a great relationship. So uh, I want to switch gears. I want to talk a little yeah. bit about CNBC. Mm -hmm. So you have a very successful hedge fund. Mm -hmm. You've got a husband. You've got four kids. Mm -hmm. Seems mm -hmm. like obviously the only thing missing is a yeah, regular there was TV a, appearance. Yeah, there was a gaping hole in, in my there. schedule. So. Um, <laughs> So how did that happen? What's been good? What's been challenging? So how does, how does it fit in with the, the rest of your life? Well, it just happened totally by chance. I had no TV experience or any interest in being on TV. I never really, it wasn't on my radar screen at all. And I was in this article, uh, there was a, uh, a magazine, Women on Wall Street, and I was one of them. And the producers at CNBC saw it and said, hey, why don't you come in and try out for this show? So I thought, all right, what the heck? So I went and I did sort of a screen test, and uh, they thought it was good, and then they said, why don't you come in, fill in for one of the guys? And at the time, the show was a male host and four, and four male uh, panelists. And then after a couple of times of my filling in, I think they needed, they realized we need a woman. And they were willing to overlook that I am not fast money at all. I am not day trading. I, that's not what I do. They didn't care as much for that. I think they felt, you know what? We need a woman. She'll do. And, <laughs> and, and then that's how it started. And, uh, and so it's a little over six years later, which I cannot believe that much time has, has flown by. And it's really fun. You, you, what do you like about it? I love the guys. The, Melissa Lee is our host now and has been for several years. I love her. Um, I like the switching gears, having a totally different way of thinking about things. It has actually made me think a little bit differently about investing. I never used to pay attention to charts and technical. I thought it was a bunch of crap. And I realize now that I don't know if it's crap or not, but if enough people think it's real, it's real. Mm -hmm. You know? Right, the yeah, I mean... Yeah. Right. If enough people believe a bank is solvent, it'll stay solvent. If enough people believe it's not, they'll make it not be solvent. So that was an interesting um, uh, thing to come to realize. And then it's just fun to be on TV. I meet lots of great people. And one thing, people call you back when you're on TV. <laughs> I don't know why, but they do. So is it so has it helped yeah. your yeah, day it job? Helps, it helps my day job. I, you know, I speak to a lot of activists, which right. is fun. Right. We had one on yesterday, uh, two days ago. Um, that's fun. Uh, it's fun, for, you know, Carl Icahn. I love chatting with him. Um, that's fun for me. I would say if, if they had had posters of Carl Icahn when I was a kid, I would have had one. <laughs> Seriously, on my wall, would have had it, but that's they didn't great. anyway. And, it, and <laughs> fitting it into your life? It's hard. Um, and this is this was sort of a weird thing. It really it wasn't working. I, I just couldn't get it all done. And my husband said, "You know what? You need to make some choices." He wasn't saying what I needed to choose. He was saying I did need to choose something, and it wasn't working. And I was thinking, "How can I do this better? How can I do it more efficiently?" And I finally realized, if hair and makeup came to my office, and I did that, I could stay at my desk the entire day through when the market was closed, have a little bit of time, and then go to the studio, that would make it work. And I called the head of the studio, and I said, this is what I need. I don't need all the other stuff. I don't need a car. I don't need all of that crap. I need hair and makeup in my office. Well, that's, it's so interesting. <laughs> I don't know if you remember, but Michael Kinsley wrote a great column when Hillary was running for president um, last time, and calculating how much time she had how much more time she had to spend getting ready for debates than Obama because of yeah. her hair and her makeup it's, and her clothes. And yeah. it was an extraordinary number and how much less sleep she got. And, and if you recall, I don't know if you remember, she had a very emotional press conference in New Hampshire. Yes. And 
she actually cited that, which is, you know, this is so hard. You know, everybody's talking about my hair. Everyone's talking about how I look. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think I, when I first had that, I thought, oh, that's ridiculous. You can weed while you're getting your hair done. It's not really a, you know, a, a, a detriment. But then I realized when they're doing your eye makeup and things, yeah. you really do have to do nothing. Um, yeah. <laughs> I guess you could have somebody speaking to you and briefing you. But right. it's one of those unfair things, it I think, unfair. that um, women do have to uh, deal with. And it's interesting to see that that was your biggest it obstacle. It really was. Because I was thinking to myself, am I really going to turn this down on account of my hair? <laughs> I mean, what guy would ever say, thanks for the opportunity, but listen, I can't make it work. My hair right. is just it's not going to work. <laughs> Well, well, your hair always looks good, so it was a good, it was a good deal. Okay, well, th I'm not in charge of my hair anymore. Oh, okay. uh, CNBC is in charge of my hair, <laughs> it's, which is fine because I wasn't doing a particularly good job of it. So, you know. I know. I, I also mm -hmm. always marvel. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but whenever anyone gets in the public eye, I don't care who they are, I don't care if they're in the public eye because they've done something good or they've done something bad. I think there's this secret group of people who just descend on them yes. and make them look amazing. And <laughs> it makes me wonder, you know, who they are, and maybe you have now discovered them. Well, there's a CNBC makeup wardrobe. The CNBC wardrobe. making people, yeah. yeah. So yeah. the book is just full of advice. Advice about business, advice about life. And I wanted to do kind of a lightning round of a few of the the topics that I found interesting and All get right. you to react um, and talk a little bit just to give people a sense of your view of the world. So one of my favorite anecdotes, um, I wish I had talked to you several years ago, was when you talked about pounding the table. I was a venture capitalist for seven and a half years, and I had a really hard time. Because when I had an investment, I would go to my partners and I would say, here's why it's good, here's why it's bad, here are the risks we're taking, here's the list of risks that we've already taken in our portfolio, here's how this fits in, let's make a decision. And they would look at me, they were largely men, like I was crazy. And they, all they wanted me to do was pound the table. Just pound the table and tell us to do the deal. And I'm thinking, well, that's kind of silly, isn't it? We're smart. Shouldn't we talk about this? That's not what they wanted. And by the way, it's a whole lot easier to pound the table with kind of a false confidence, honestly, because how much confidence can you have in an, a company that's 10 minutes old that's got 7 to 10 years to prove itself than it is to try to analyze it and take informed risks. I could never, ever get over that until the very end when I said, you know, screw it. I'm just going to pound the table. You know, I'm not going to go through this anymore. If I have a deal I like, I'm pounding the table, even though in my heart I was always doing the, you know, the this. Yeah. You yeah. talk about that as a huge difference between men and women mm -hmm. that you've seen, and I'd really love for you to talk to folks about what you saw and how you overcame that. Well, it was really an epiphany for me. I, I ran into a male friend of mine who's a hedge fund manager, and we're good friends, and I said, why do you have no women on your team? You have no m female analysts. And he said, look, it's not that I don't think they're smart. They're just as smart. The thing is, I have a limited amount of capital to allocate, and a man will come in and pound the table with his idea and talk about wh how much money we can make, all of our upside. And a woman will come in, and she'll lay out all the risks, everything that could go wrong. He said, so I have this limited amount of capital. I fall for the upside every time. So what do I need the women for to come, you know? Well, so by the way, one of my investments was the best in the fund. So I mean, there are something about women. Some of your investments were yes, the best but he in the was, fund. I, I so appreciated the candor, because right when he said it, I knew he was right. And I tried to think about, why do women do that? And I think the reason women do that is to be risk averse. Because they say to themselves, all right, if I lay out all the risks and the portfolio manager chooses to buy it anyway, and if it doesn't work out, well, then I told him all the things could go wrong, so it's on him. But we can't, we can't advance if it's never on us. It has to be on us. And if you want to move up, you've got to take the risk. So pound the table. Start with that. If you were, you know, if you were in a uh, at a debate, you wouldn't start with, well, the other side is a lot of good arguments. <laughs> you know, yeah. you got to go with what your strength is. Then, if they come ask and ask you the risk, sure, you got to know them and understand them, but don't lead with how you could lose half your money right away. Yeah, no, I think <laughs> it's I think it's great advice, mm -hmm. and I think it's it's an, a universal truth that I have seen um, the pounding the table is what's required, certainly in the investment world. And, and so. I do, I, I'm aware of when I'm doing it, and I also filter, when I have the women analysts present to me an idea, I filter their idea through this lens of their always talking about downside first. Yep. 
so on page 47 of your book, you talk about people, you like people who have the confidence to respectfully disagree. So there with was, me, you mean? Or, yes, yeah, yes, uh -huh. with you. And um, there was one thing that you wrote about that I have a different experience. And, and that was when you talked about that working from home was like a sexual fantasy. So uh, first There's of all. There's a little more to it than that. Right. Well, and, you know, first of all, I hope both of us have more interesting sexual fantasies <laughs> than just working from home. But, you know. Wait, 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 wait. I got to add the rest of it. Working from home is like a sexual fantasy. That never mostly happens. what yes. doesn't work right. out. That doesn't work out. Yes, and, not that right. the working from home is a sexual fantasy. Well, for, actually, for, you know, that's, what, that's where I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit, because... It's not. It's you, not my sexual fantasy you, working from home. Well, and, and in fact, you think it's the... You, you talk about it being the worst of everything. Yeah. Inefficient, bad for work, and for relationships with your family. So I've worked at home, and my husband has worked at home for most of our careers. Many, many people in our company work from home by choice. And I work from home by choice. Um, and I run a company, and it's, you know, it's, it works. And I love it. I have no commute. I don't have to do hair and makeup unless, mm -hmm. although with Skype, I have to do it a little more than I used mm -hmm. to. I don't have to deal with politics and small talk. I'm effective. I'm focused. Um, I make the effort to be with people when I need to, so it's not that I'm you know, never there. And it's funny, the main, one of the main reasons you talk about not liking it is the chance encounter. And I find that it's the chance encounter with my 16-year-old daughter who may deign to spend two minutes with me when she walks in the room and tell me about her life that makes it work for me. So I'm just mm -hmm. curious whether, you, maybe it's unique to finance or whether there are things about working from home that you've just had a bad experience with because I mm -hmm. feel that a lot of the world is moving in that direction, either by choice or mm -hmm. companies more and more not have, even Amex, I'm told now, does not give people permanent offices. They literally come in every day to a locker, they get yeah. a little trolley and get assigned to a room. So the, the notion of a permanent office and your work home is, mm -hmm. is diminishing. So I just want to hear you talk a little more about right. that issue in a way that, you know, I think at least there's another side to that, mm -hmm. to that story. Well, I, I understand a lot of reasons why one needs to work from home, but why I think ultimately it isn't good, it's sort of the flip side of your saying that chance encounter with your daughter. To me, it's very difficult for the children to see that you're home and yet to be ignored. I think they find that very difficult. I think they can get used to the idea of your leaving but they can't get used to the idea of, of them feeling ignored. And I feel that creating the boundaries between work and home in a very clear way, which certainly going to an office does, really helps you establish those boundaries yeah. for the rest yeah. of the day. When yeah. you are home from the office, you are home from the office. And so that was part of it. And it's also the chance encounter at work and the last part of it is, it's interesting that you're the boss that works from home because I think if you're the boss that works from home, the office has that substitute teacher kind of a day feeling. <laughs> I really yeah. do. Well, the boss isn't here and, you know, I, I, I feel like you know. there are many jobs that it doesn't work. I understand that. I'm just saying for me, I prefer that my people are in the office. I have a bit of resentment if I call home and they're not there and they're picking their kid up from, I yeah. understand one needs to do that. I have kids, I get it. But, but it's not my choice. It's not my first choice for them. But if I like them and want to keep them, I, you know, yeah. I, I can and The, the one it. thing I would say is, as, as the, th the interesting thing about having a, more of a virtual workforce is it forces you to really measure productivity and outcome in, in ways far more than you have to do when you're in person. Because if you're sitting next to someone, you know, they look busy. They look like they're working. Yes. <laughs> you know, you actually don't know what they're looking at, but right. they look busy. And if you aren't physically there, the only thing you can look at is what they've actually produced. And that in, is some, a very good in point. some ways, mm -hmm. it does make you, as a manager, force yourself to know what output you're expecting from everybody. So it's just something to think about right? as you no, that, continue. That last point to me is the most, the, the most uh, salient to the, your side of the argument. Well, I was hoping <laughs> I could persuade you yeah. to be a, a little more open-minded open at this. So another place I wanted to, you know, found myself asking questions. Uh, you opened up by saying you went to Wall Street for the money. And I totally agree that you've got to be self-sufficient, particularly women. Um, but I'd be curious, 
what would you say to one of your kids if they said, you know, I really want to be a teacher. I know your mother was a teacher. Mm -hmm. I really want to be a journalist. Um, I really want to be in public policy or, politi mm -hmm. or in politics because none of those things are places where, for most people, you will be able to make an enormous amount of money. Right. How would you react to that? Well, my little daughter told me she wanted to be a gymnast. Oh. Yeah, she, don't worry, Mom, I'm going to be a professional gymnast. <laughs> okay, she's cute, but she's terrible. Okay. <laughs> and I said, listen, we're Jewish, you know, and how many Jewish gymnasts do you know? <laughs> so we have to regroup and think about another plan. So I... You know, I, I, I wrestle with that, and we will, we've started to tell them a little bit about the choices they make will dictate how they're going to, you know, how, what kind of lifestyle they can live. And uh, I think at 12 years old, they're not quite ready to hear it. Probably not at 16, they're not quite ready to hear it. Um, I... I don't know how it's going to work out in the real world. And I don't know, there's four kids, so I don't know how it's going to work out if some of them are choosing fields that are more lucrative and others not. And my husband and I wonder about, well, uh, do we, what do we tell them about leaving them money or, yeah. you know, that's... Because it affects the decisions. Yes. We don't want that to affect their decision. And we, we, that's important. So, um, but I, but I do, I do have a little bit different message for the girls about pounding in that they have to be self-sufficient, and the boys seem to get that message already. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's 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 hard because you know you see lots of people. My my husband talks about actually David Brooks. My husband's a journalist and a public policy person, so I know a lot about making those choices and what impacts those have. And David Brooks, the New York Times columnist, talks about status income disequilibrium which is you, someone like David Brooks, who's brilliant and very well known, makes about $220,000 a year from the New York Times. And he's around a lot of people who make a lot more money. And so he talks about feeling you know, kind of like a weird disequilibrium between his status in the world and his financial security. And I think you know, what you're really talking about is related to that point, because there are a lot of worthy things that people do because they're drawn to them. But they may not be things that allow you to have the kind of income that being on Wall Street would. And I think that tension is a tension that actually a lot of people in the millennial generation are probably struggling with themselves right now. And so mm -hmm. just thinking about that and you know, maybe your kids will be there or maybe they won't. But it was, it was one thing that struck me as I read your book. And in fact, most of the millennials, what you hear is that they're more motivated today by the, the worth of what they're doing and the experience of what they're doing than they are about money. So it'll be interesting to see if that pendulum mm -hmm. changes. Right. But, but I think you have to tell that. I don't think they realize different fields pay different things. Well, I think there's a, I, I certainly didn't know what journalism paid when I got married to my <laughs> husband. But um, now, uh, now I understand. It's a good thing he's cute. Yeah. yeah. So exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so one of the things you said that I loved the most um, was in connection with the hurdles that women face in business. Um, and you were talking about it from the point of view of finance, but it's, you know, just in the last week, we heard Twitter is going public with not one woman on their board and not one woman in an operating role. The major story in the New York Times this uh, Sunday about the lack of women in science. I mean, it is a problem that is not going away. And you said something that has really always been my approach. And you said, my approach has always been to focus on reality and not belabor the inequality. And I have always believed that. But I have to say, I'm starting to question it. Because when I see 40 years after I first you know, started reading about Women's Lib and Ms. Magazine, we are not much further along. Um, and so I wonder if maybe I'm wrong about that. I love it because it's how I've lived my life. Mm -hmm. But I, I do worry that maybe there's more to what's going on in the world in terms of how women are treated and how women are dealt with, that we should be a little more aggressive. And I'll go even further. Um, uh, Elsa Walsh, who is actually Bob Woodward's wife, who wrote a beautiful column in um, the Washington Post uh, after Sheryl Sandberg's book. And I want to hear your reaction to Sheryl Sandberg's mm -hmm. book in a minute. And she said she feels that our generation, I'm a little older than you, but close enough, our generation let down our daughters. And we let them down because we didn't fight enough 
to change the culture and change what's going on in the world so that we are not, we're no further, we're not that further, much further along than we were 40 years ago when we, you and I entered the workplace. So I just wanted to, I, I love what you're saying and yet for me, I feel a little ambivalent. And I wanna know, you know, how do you square that attitude with the really uncomfortable realities that we're still dealing with across the board? And what do you think about Sheryl Sandberg's approach? Uh, well, I, I think Sheryl Sandberg's approach is great. Uh, I just even the title, Lean In, I think is really excellent. And I think that, you know, she talks a lot in her book about how uh, powerful women are seen as unattractive, uh, personality-wise, uh, unattractive, something unattractive about that. And I th Or ambition is not something that uh, I've noticed. Ambition is seen as a personality trait that's not good. It's okay to be a successful woman, but not to want to be a successful woman somehow, which is a, a very, it's nuanced, but it's very odd. And I think that we have to just get comfortable with the idea of people seeing us as ambitious, even if there's a little bit of a negative to that. All right, so what? That's the cause of advancement? Uh, fine. Right. I think also that it is happening more slowly than I had imagined. And I think it'll be another generation. When I interview younger people now, I feel like the playing field is much more balanced. You see just as many women MBAs. I know Wharton, where I went, is 46% this year yeah. MBA. So it, it's, it's, it's more balanced. Very often, many, many times, the guys have come from a class where the woman was the valedictorian, and you know they view women absolutely as, as just as motivated. And just what you were saying about millennials, some of the men are stepping out a little bit, and that wasn't happening before. And I think when that happens, when they step out a little, there's a little bit of a vacuum. How Twitter has no women on the board is astounding to me it for two reasons. One, there are no women that felt they thought they were valuable. And two, are they that dumb just from a PR standpoint yeah. to not have a woman? Or what? what yeah. uh, it's, it's crazy. But it, that it is says crazy. something that they felt confident. I don't think they thought out. about it. Oh, I, it's hard for me to believe they didn't think about it. At first, I think, right. what? Well, I think that's what they thought. Actually, they're not making money, but that's a whole other story. But, uh, but, 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 the, um, but you know, the, tru the truth is, it's, it, I find it shocking. I find it yeah, shocking. Yeah, I and, found that shocking. But The only woman in the, uh, in the executive team at all is a lawyer who they brought in six weeks ago. So somebody obviously said, said oh, my uh -oh. God, we have right. to have some woman up there. But I think it was woman. honestly an oversight originally. Right. Now, right. of course, that it's a public thing, that, or, you know, yeah. that it, the, the board makeup is out there, they've thought of it. But I originally think it was an oversight. I saw a thing, someone invited me to a value investing conference. I looked at it, 25 male speakers, no women. Astounding to me, and I, I thought, what if I had sent them a email here? Come to this value investing conference. Twenty-five female speakers, no men. Yeah. I mean, you would never find that. I, I, I am still frustrated with how it is, but some of it, I, you know, I, um, it's gonna, the change is gonna happen slower. But I do believe it's gonna happen. I also believe that the ranks of the middle level managers, which are a lot women. We need another 20 years to get them in senior roles, or I mean, 15. You know, it's interesting. I, I think what's going to accelerate it is that you're going to see the baby boomers retiring, and you're going to see women having a greater percentage of the graduate degrees, and you're yes. going to have such a talent squeeze at the top that there's going to be no choice. And I hope that will happen. And you're going to see you know, men who will be the stay-at-home dad. Yes, you will see the millennials. And I that think will three, have to happen. I, I agree with you. I hope it's not 20 years, but because it might one be. thing, another thing Cheryl says in her book that I think is so spot on is she said, "I know of no women, zero successful women who do not have an equal partner at home." I think that maybe it's sense. not. Maybe he's not a stay-at-home, but a equal hands-on partner. And women have to give up a little bit of that power at home of being the number yeah. one parent. Which you've done, I mean, I, there's some really mm -hmm. interesting arrangements that you and Lawrence have. Yes. Maybe mm -hmm. we should talk about that for a minute. How he takes on, and he's no slouch. I mean, mm -hmm. he's working 60 or 80 mm -hmm. hours a week in a very intense, mm -hmm. successful mm -hmm. company in finance as well. I mean, you all have a division that's kind of interesting. It, it is. Well, he's the most organized guy of all time. It's just ridiculous. I, th this is a true story. I was changing a light bulb, and I say, all right, well, i got to go to the store. i got to get some of these bulbs. And he said, 
That's it? You don't have a list of all the fixtures with every bulb and what we need? Uh, no, of course not. Well, now we have a list of every fixture we have and every bulb it needs and an inventory of those bulbs already. Yes. Which is nice, I guess. I mean, it's great. He has the, the warm, weather pack, warm weather vacation packing list. You put in the number of days, and it shoots out an Excel. Oh, we need four sweaters and four. The I think he could license that. That's yeah, it, it's that. ridiculous. And I'm so. always like, all right, if we're out of mustard, we're out of mustard. He sees that as a failure of our systems. <laughs> there is a procedural breakdown. This needs to be addressed. Where did it go wrong? Who is the backup mustard? I'm like, oh, we, don't, we don't have mustard. <laughs> that is true. So he's, so he's doing a lot of his fair share. He definitely does his fair share. But some things, you know what? He does what he wants to do and does not feel the least bit of guilt about what he doesn't want to do. So he just said, look, I will never get up with our children in the middle of the night. I will hire someone or you do it. But I will not do it. That was very clear. <laughs> very clear. But yeah. he does cooking and he He does some he, cooking. He, yeah, and, he did, uh, yeah, he you know, he, he does it. Does it. He was That's at the great. orthodontist and um, yeah. So so I can't let this end without talking about your advice to women to use their sexuality more and to flirt more. Um, I have to say I thought it was really honest and brave. I also thought a lot of women do it and won't admit it. Yeah. And um, it probably rang true to a whole lot of people. And I'm just curious what kind of reaction you got. Bad, to bad reaction. <laughs> yeah, bad, bad. Yeah. Like, what are you, an idiot? And, and, I'm, and I really felt like, come on, be truthful here. Yeah. There is a place for it. Yeah. There really is. Now, I'm not saying, I, I'm not at all saying, oh, try to sleep your way to the top. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying, there you could you know it, you can have a little bit of flirtation and that's okay i know i give the example of you know if we have guests on our show and uh would i flirt with them absolutely i would um <laughs> you know but i but you know not with someone who works for me or who i work for but that no. still leaves an awful lot <laughs> of room people out there <laughs> so I, the last few minutes before we go to questions um <laughs> I have a new favorite definition of having it all. Um, it's a term I usually hate. I don't like it. Yeah, I don't like right. to use it. But um, it's from Delia Efron, who's Nora Efron's sister, who wrote um, Harry Met Sally and a lot of great movies. And she defines having it all as that magical time when what you want and what you have match up. Mm -hmm. And it's the first definition of having it all that I really resonated with. And so here's the question I think everybody in the room was probably wanting to ask you, um, which is, how do you do it? How mm -hmm. do you do all the things you do? Um, and if you haven't read the book, I'm going to share two things that you do that I know I could never do. Um, you said you have no downtime and that you only eat sweets once a year on your birthday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, after reading your book, I have to tell you, I cannot look at dessert or those cookies mm -hmm. without thinking, what would Karen do? And uh -huh. you know, I, I drank green juice all day today, <laughs> just knowing I was coming here. And you know, the, but the truth is, I think it would be interesting for uh -huh. people to hear, how, how do you make all this work? Because there's a lot of- I have of been exhausted since 1997, <laughs> as one of it. And you know that that definition is so interesting because I do think what did I what do I really want what do I, I want to be needed, and I do feel like I'm needed, and I want to not want for anything, and I I do feel that, but I also feel there's so many definitions for different people of having it all right? right, and some people would look at my life and say God that looks awful, that really. The, you know, look stressful, awful, and and they might not be wrong. You know, <laughs> uh, so um, I, I'm. I don't know. The downtime is that's the the hardest part. And for me, I really when I talked about that early on stage of doing the show when I really wasn't working, it just was too much. And then I realized I had this perspective shift that was, I'm doing the show for me really. No one, you know, made me do this. And once I looked at it as, wow, that's me time that I'm doing every day, mm -hmm. then it was a lot easier to drop a lot of the other things, like looking at modern art and things like that. And uh, as for the sweets, to me, it's much easier to never eat them <laughs> than eat a little. It's kind of like the kids, yeah. right? Yeah. If, if, if you're home working, 
yes. you know, they, they think Which, you yeah. can't ignore them. So. But it does make me want, one, one last thing I do want to bring up, multitasking, how I've done a 180 on multitasking. This was a big revelation to me. I think multitasking is an enormous waste of time. Well, okay. well and it, you're right. It really is because every time you switch activities, you have to backtrack a little. Where was I? What was I doing? Oh, I got to get out those papers or whatever it is. The more you switch, the more you backtrack, the more time you waste. Well, actually, there's been brain research um, that shows that when you multitask, you're using twice as much brain power and it's exhausting. So you're yeah. exactly right. I mean, uh, so. so uh, I'm going to end with one question uh, that someone actually asked me last week. I was giving a speech um, about women in leadership, mm -hmm. and no one had ever asked me this before, and it really caught me off guard, and I thought it was really interesting. So I'm going to ask it to you. It's that they asked me, what's the best part of your day? Mm, what's the best part of my day? That's good. Um, it is not the working out. That is really not <laughs> the best part of my day. Um, right when I come home, from the show is the best part of my day, usually. It has gotten more and more as time goes by. My children get a little older. That becomes more and more the best part of my day. And it used to be when I would come home, my kids would look at me and they knew, one, did I make or lose money? <laughs> and two, did I outperform the market or underperform the market, which was really the more important point. And, I, and when it dawned on me one day when they were like, oh, Mommy, you underperformed today, I can tell. <laughs> I thought, wow, I need to get my head out of that. And so uh, as I've gotten older, and it's, I can see the end of their time with us now. Yeah. You yeah. know, it comes so quickly. That's so right. that is the best part of my day. That's great. What was your answer? What was the best part of your I'm day? I'm embarrassed to say mm -hmm. that I said the best part of my day is um, when I wake up and I see all the wonderful work that the people on the East Coast have mm -hmm. done in our company because what makes me happy is that things are happening and people are doing things and, and they're moving the company mm -hmm. forward while I sleep. And I think <laughs> that's like <laughs> fantastic. And, and then that I, is a good business model. And then I, and then I, and then I, and then I realized, oh my God, I didn't mention my daughter. And then I realized why she is 16 years old, uh, yeah. and a junior, and, and right. Karen has two. And you know, her coming home is not the best part of my day right yes. now. Um, it used right. to be. So I felt a little guilty for a few minutes, but um, yeah. but I thought it was an interesting question. It is a and great it, question. And eight years ago, the best part of my day would be when the kids were finally asleep. Yes. And I, I did not hear a word from them. <laughs> so I'm going to switch to questions now, but I want to thank Karen for just an incredibly oh, honest you. and <laughs> wonderful uh, conversation. Um, and I'm going to read the questions as they appear to me in, in front of this magic machine. And uh, hopefully, if anyone has questions, you will listen to Mike and figure out how to get them onto this machine. So the first question is that, Karen, you're always great on CNBC. But do you think for normal investors like myself that maybe we shouldn't watch CNBC much? Um, us little guys can't compete with market pros. And if we get too focused on day-to-day -day markets, we may do things we shouldn't, like overtrade. That's a great question. That is a great question. And I think you're on to something. And this occurred to me after being on CNBC for a while that um, Financial media is in the business of manufacturing and distributing news, even if there is none. They need to make news. That's what they do. They need content. And so they always need to make news so that you feel like you always need to watch, and then you always need to react. Because who sponsors these shows? Who pays the bills? Often, it's trading companies, it's, you know, uh, E-Trade or whatever it is. And that's who is somewhat behind the business. So I think it's really important to, to recognize that. And I am not a day trader at all. I, I just I don't get it. I feel like how could the value of the business have changed between lunch and you know now? And uh, and I, so for me, I wouldn't trade that way. I wouldn't follow it. But many people do. I try to bring a different voice. Great. Mm -hmm. So next question. In your book, you say, for lots of women, it's OK to be successful, but the wanting is what gets in our way. Mm -hmm. Do you see this trend changing with the younger generation? I do. I, I do. I think that men are, I don't know if they're boys now or men, but in college, I don't know. Uh, 
they're used to seeing women who want to be at the top, who want to uh, perform well. I, I think it's coming along. I mean, I, I hope you're right. Mm -hmm. I, I often talk about how depressed I was when I saw the Time cover of Sheryl Sandberg. And if you remember, the headline was, don't hate me because I'm successful, which is exactly mm -hmm. 40 years ago what Martina Horner, who was then dean of Radcliffe, which was the female version of Harvard, female side of Harvard, her famous studies on fear of success showed that very, um, very prominent women were actually secretly afraid of their success. And the idea that 40 years later, Time Magazine would put that on top of Sheryl Sandberg, mm -hmm. I thought was terrible. But and so I hope, mm -hmm. I hope you're right. But, but let I me ask you something. Don't you think there's a lot of men out there who are very successful who are hated? And they're all right with it. I agree with you. I think mm -hmm. that one of the things I talk about is how at the air at the top is thin. Mm -hmm. And that causes problems for women and men. It's just that more women than men are complaining about it. And, and uh, Right. I think I, that men don't care if they're hated. They women don't care do. If women hated, care too much. They don't, they don't care. And, um, and I think your attitude is exactly right. I mean, I, I got a, um, a 360 done on me once in a previous job, and one of the things where... You know, I think you're a little aggressive, and you know, sometimes you seem angry when you give feedback. And you know, I thought, I just don't care. Uh -huh. You know, I don't care, and I think that you Good. need that attitude. Need but I still think that you've got. It's, I think it's a shame that. But with men, all the men have it too. Look, look Larry Ellison. If you saw him on the cover of Time, you know, he's the right. uh, you know America's Cup billionaire, blah blah blah. He's not particularly adored. I think that's a really Nor does good he point. care. That's right. He does not care. He right. does not care. He so owns most of Malibu. He really doesn't, doesn't care. Doesn't care. You know, Look at me. Happy. I win. That's right. so that's what he's saying. I, I think you're right. Yeah. I think you're totally right. So, so well, here it's a, it's a good question, kind of a follow-on to this. How do you think culture and business should address the problems that face not only women but women of color as well? That's a it's a good question. <laughs> How do I think culture? Um, to me, uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm not getting it, but to me, the issue of women in business um, and women of color in business, I don't see as that different. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I don't get it. But I think that um, just as I look at, I mean, I feel like my kids are growing up in such a more multicultural, much more diverse. That that's just how they're used to that. It's I not agree. unusual for them in any way, like it was for us. There were, you know, I went to Beverly Hills High School. How many women of color? Not very many at all. And my kids, it's, it's just a different world. I have to imagine that that will funnel up. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Yes, sir. But if, please, I, I yeah. know I could be no, no, missing no, 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 the boat. No, no. That I think that's the story that you were talking about. Everything that you said about women and the issues that they are faced with, uh -huh. black people have been faced with it since they got here. Mm -hmm. And that's what mm -hmm. I was yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, all these cultural changes, as Karen said, I think are going to happen just as the world becomes right. more multicultural. More I, multicultural. But more slowly than we would like, for I, sure. I agree. Next question here is, as a female CEO, a big challenge I face is balancing mm -hmm. work and life relationships. What is your advice for time management and getting it all as a female? Time management. I mean, you're, that, you know better than anyone the time management issue yeah, is it's real. I mean, right. I, you know, you've got. I, I always think you have to. This, this sounds wrong, but edit your ambition. You cannot do everything, mm -hmm. and you have to decide what moves the needle in your job. Right. You know, I used to when I was a venture capitalist, I used to want to be a leader in the firm, but I only wanted to work eighty percent of the time. You can't be a leader right. in the firm and do what really matters, which is find deals. Deals mm -hmm. are what move the needle. Deals are what I get measured on. Mm -hmm. So I had to give up setting time leaders. I think it's right. ruthless prioritization and honesty about what matters to you. And I think it is trying to contain the guilt. Women suffer from this guilt over not doing everything that men don't suffer from. 
And, you know, for me, I know I am not going to go to every single one of my kids' soccer game, field hockey, whatever it is. I'm going to pick a few, and I'm going to go. But I'm not going to go to every single one. And, I, and I'm okay with it, and they're used to it. Maybe they wish, maybe they wish, and I understand that, that uh, I would go to every one. But I think about it. My mother, who passed away last year, I think she could have been very successful in business if she, if she had pursued that. I wouldn't have, I would have wished that she would have pursued that. So maybe you don't get to, you don't, your perspective changes when you get older. And um, I know sometimes my kids wish I were home. They never wish I cooked for them after <laughs> I have tried it once or twice. But, um, I, but, I, but I'm okay with the guilt of it. I, um, yeah. I'm, I, it it's okay. It, it's interesting um, because I do think men feel a lot of the tension that women feel today. I think it's not just women. I think women just talk about it more. And men don't feel as free to make choices around it. They feel a little more trapped. But I, I do think that I, there's a biological difference to being, well, I always say, you know, a, a newborn cries in the middle of the night. The man maybe wakes up, maybe doesn't, and says, oh, I wish I could do something to help. And the woman lactates. Right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a, a very different response. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Well, that's a, so, actually a perfect segue to okay. the next question, which is, uh, <laughs> Do you have any advice for working mothers about how they can make maternity leave work best? Mm. I have a chapter in my book about maternity leave is really a bad, not that we shouldn't have it, but be aware of the resentment that maternity leave causes at work. Be aware of it. Um, and so the advice I would give is, for me it was very easy. I was going back to work, no questions about it, no doubts. If you're not sure about it, I would really hide that ambivalence <laughs> as well as you can until you decide. Because if you, if you put that ambivalence out there, it will be received. And you don't want that because it will compromise your career. Keep that ambivalence inside until you decide. Was there resentment mm -hmm. from men or women or both? Both. Whoever needs to fill in for whoever's taking maternity leave. Yeah, it's interesting. And, you know, in our company, I can't remember how many uh, babies have been born to both men and women. And in some ways, I think it depends on the culture of the company. I think I may be wrong, but I think in our company, when, when folks have, have need to be out for maternity leave, everyone's happy because they know they'll get a similar treatment when they need time, whether it's maternity or whether it's an elderly parent. And does, I don't think have, I hope, don't have that kind of resentment because it's all about making space for everybody's life while they're working. And as long as they know they're going to get their turn, maybe it I, doesn't go so bad. I feel like the, when, when you are, one is out on maternity leave, either others have to fill in and do that work, and that is an extra burden on them, usually for no extra compensation, mm -hmm. right. or... It doesn't really need, they don't really need to fill in. The job just seems to be easily divided up with that. And then where are you? Right. So then, then you have nothing to come right? back to. And then, yeah, it's an, it's an interesting question. And yet, you know, my one experience now um, with running a company like we have is that it's always something. I mean, human beings yeah. always have something. They get sick. Their kids get sick. Their parents get sick. They have a once-in-a-lifetime trip with, you know, their family. Yes. It's always something. Right. And it's very hard to manage a business and not have some flex in there for life. I mean, even not necessarily about work-life balance. I'm just saying for just life. And, you know, hopefully, uh, particularly as men find that they want to take time for other things, maybe this will become a little less of a less of a big resentment point. You're right. There is always something. There's Divorce, always something. Whatever. Something. There's something always something. Comes up. So, Karen, what advice will you give to your kids, especially your daughters, about what their attitude toward money should be? Uh, there, so someone asked me, how do you get financially independent children? I, first answer is you tell them they need to be financially independent, <laughs> which is often news to them. <laughs> and it's really important. And the, as I said, my daughters didn't seem to be getting that idea. And so 
we started trying to teach them a little bit about some how business works. We had them save some of their allowance, and we wanted to teach them about interest and saving. And so we pay them 10%. Um, because uh, when we first started, the, giving them the 0.008% didn't really compound, and they didn't really get the message. <laughs> so we pay him 10%, and my son, one of my sons, he gets it. He went, borrowed from his grandma to get the 10%, which he knew he couldn't get elsewhere, so he's levering up from grandma and then <laughs> splitting the profit. So that was good. Um, I, I think they, um, telling them, uh, and they, and I, I believe, a lot of people disagree with me, but I like to tell them how much things cost. Yeah, I agree. And I think, so I, doing my kids, uh, you know, um, w w whatever it might be, we were d a, a summer home and, you know, decorating their room or something like that. I asked my kids, all right, they want a this or that kind of bed, and uh, how much does it cost? My daughter thought it was a million dollars. And my son, the one who wanted the lever up from his grandma, he said, well, I know how much the house costs because I saw it on Google. It was asking price, but I'm thinking you paid less. <laughs> so he's, you know, he kind of gets it. But I think yeah, that's the first way to start. Exactly. Getting him to know how much things cost and then how long do most people have to work to get that they oh, yeah. never think about it. I, that I agree with that. I, I know for my daughter, because they do, these kids, if they're lucky, and you know, many of them are in West LA and upper you know, New York are lucky, they, they have money. So just telling them this is what it costs. So what I try to do when I'm trying to make the lesson mm -hmm. is I make her work at $10 an hour to pay oh, okay. for whatever it is she wants. So she really knows she had to work 30 hours to get that pair of earrings. And uh -huh. just, in, you know, it's a, it's a way to translate it that they really understand. Right, it, know? It, that's tangible. Yeah. It, yep. It's real. You know, I, one thing we didn't talk about in your book is you have a, a lot of thoughts about making sure women manage their money well and are comfortable managing money. And I think we should take a minute on that. What do you think is missing? Why women don't take responsibility? Uh, they, they either they don't want to. They think they can't. It's not interesting to them. They feel like if they don't make the money, it's not their place. A lot of reasons, none of which are good. And I think women also sometimes have the perception that men have a genetic dis predisposition toward understanding finance that women don't, which is ridiculous. And so I think sometimes it's a, it's a cop-out. Sometimes they weren't raised that way or the parents never talked about money in general. Women just have to not be afraid to ask questions and not be afraid to start small and to to learn and to be engaged um, the idea of just surrendering over the money and not asking where it goes not understanding what the strategy is mm -hmm. that is uh, too many women just default I, I can't understand it you know I say you'd never you know have a your partner tell you how to vote or where your kids are going to school or what house you would buy with having no input from you or even the example, the terrible example of a woman going to a doctor, it would be him dying or her doctor diagnosing her with breast cancer and her saying, don't talk to me about it, just talk to my husband, decide with him, I know you two will do what's best, just tell me whatever you decide, I don't want to be involved, I'm not going to educate myself, I'm not going to speak to other people about it, I'm not going to learn anything. You'd never have that conversation. So what do you, th and what should they do if, if women are interested in if they're interested and they responsibility. and uh, let's say they're uh, married already and uh, if that's the scenario say what do we own where is it why is it there what is the strategy who is it? do we have an advisor can i talk to them yeah. i mean all of those things and and don't be afraid to ask questions doesn't matter how stupid you might think it is no i agree so next mm. question what's the responsibility of women leaders to close the gap in corporate america and wall street for young women coming up responsibility that is such a good question because here's the thing that you touched on a little bit Janet Yellen was just made okay so there is sort of a big qualifier she's the first woman yep. um, do you do, do, do you ever pull women up who are um, certainly if they're more qualified that's easy and even if they're as qualified to me that's easy too. I'd rather take the as qualified woman. What do you do if there's a dearth of women 
and you have a couple who maybe are not quite as qualified. I don't know. Um, the, I don't know. Uh, in some ways, I, I do feel like bring them up, people grow into it. I do feel like there's a little, that that could I mean, work. it's interesting. Mm -hmm. I remember reading a study that one of the places there was a real discrepancy between men and women is that people viewed men as much more able to stretch into a new role than women. I mean, if you think about mm -hmm. promotion inside a major company, often you're going to a role that, you know, you haven't done before. And the ability to imagine that a man could do it was very different than the ability to imagine that a woman could do it. And so I think being aware of some of those biases that women have as well as men. If yes, you read women the, have uh, them just or more. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the piece about uh, scientists, physics uh, scientists in particular at Yale, which was in the New York Times last week, was all about, it was, it was horrible to read it. They talked about have two resumes, Jane and Joe, identical sent it out to the physics you know, community, and everyone wanted to hire Joe, and no one wanted to hire Jane, and the few who wanted to hire Jane offered her $4,000 less than Joe. I mean, you know, there really is, as much as you don't, that's what I was saying earlier, as much as you don't want to believe it or deal with this, mm -hmm. there is every now and then a little nagging that maybe there, there really are some things that are going on in the world, and maybe we, on the margins, have to try a little harder. Um, to imagine women being able to stretch, to imagine them. And the women themselves need to do it. We need to them, do it. Put I don't out there. Could, yeah. right. I agree. Risk. Is there anything that you could say to your sons about working with women? Mm, I feel like they w they're used to it already. I have yeah. two sets of twins, so that, um, which is a very efficient way to have <laughs> four children. And each set is a boy and a girl, and so they, that's all they know. Right. So my sons get them, and Lauren, my little son, twins used to think my husband and I were twins. So we just had <laughs> twins, twins, twins. <laughs> so, and they just assumed they would have twins. That's how you have kids, you have twins. Right. So um, I feel like they get it because they see the parents of, you know, sort of, we are co-CEOs of 830 Park Avenue Corporation. That's how they look at us. Um, and they see it, and, and um, I think it's, it's common for them. I keep coming back to it. The generation, two generations behind us, it's common for them. It's interesting. My, my daughter, when I hear her friends talk, a lot of the boys, if their mothers don't work, still think they don't want their wives to work. It's very oh, really? derivative ah. of their own experience, and that scares me a little yeah. bit. Um, you know, they, they, people like what they grew up with. So I think it's something, again, you have to kind of keep your eye off. I think your, your yeah. boys probably have the single best example in the country of, you know, why it's good to have a woman who works. Um, this is a good, I don't know if people know your sister's background, but oh, okay. uh, the push for stronger females in business starts with seeing it in film. When can we have a strong female lead trader on Wall Street in a film? Sounds, ah. like, a, sounds like a job for Wendy. For Wendy, I don't know yes. if you all know who my sister is, Wendy Feinerman. She is a movie producer. She won an Oscar for Forrest Gump, which she produced. She did Devil Wears Prada, which I think was just fantastic. Um, a number of other movies, but she's... Uh, She's a uh, stepmom. Uh, thank you. It's from my aunt. Um, uh, so uh, women, I don't know that. Uh, I'm trying to think. Who's the most powerful woman, traitor? What was woman? Demi Moore in um, that movie where she was uh, going after Michael Douglas? She was a Oh, Disclosure? Yeah, well, she was a CEO. I don't know if she was a oh, traitor. And that she was sexually harassing. That wasn't what I was saying <laughs> before. It's a good. In the it's right. A good, it's a good. I mean, it is when a great question. you know what I don't. I, that's sadly, I don't know who it would be. Well, um, it's something to think about. It is, and and I, and this is not uh, false modesty or anything. It wouldn't be me by a long shot. There are women who are, are ten, hundred times more. Powerful, more everything, but, uh, but they don't have two sets of twins and a show on CNBC. So okay, <laughs> so they don't. <laughs> but um, oh, that's a good question. I wish I wish someone jumped out at me. So um, this looks like mm -hmm. one of the one of the ones we'll close with. Maybe a few more um, after this. What's the best advice you've ever received and the worst? Uh, the best advice I've ever received, probably. 
probably was from my mother, which is make your bed every day. I didn't ask whether you felt like it, which is a metaphor for, it's also make your bed every day, but it's also a metaphor for get up and do it. I don't care. I don't want to hear excuses. No whining. Just do it. I, you know, you're going to have to do things that you didn't feel like. And so not giving in to whatever it is, fear, laziness, uh, who knows what. Make your bed every day. The worst advice I ever received, uh, that, that you all one by two sounded like a good idea. <laughs> but that was my fault, I know. Um, <laughs> the worst advice I ever received. Uh, I don't know, but I feel like uh, some, probably something like wait your turn. Something like that. That's good. That's good. When there really is no your turn coming. You got to make, you got to, you're, you're, you know, one, one other one, um, the, the best advice, the Michael Fox Foundation, which uh, I'm on the board of, they have a saying, who's in charge of curing Parkinson's? We are. They didn't, they weren't given that mantle. They just took it and they own it now. And that's how we all should be. You're in charge. Don't wait for somebody else. You're in charge. Right. And, and similar mm -hmm. to Cheryl Sandberg's kind of just jump yes. in, lean in. Do lean it. in. Just the phrase is so great. So the next question mm -hmm. comes from someone who's a CEO who says, I often have people telling me how I should be running my business unsolicited. How would you deal with this mm -hmm. and how do you choose who to listen to? Good question. Mm. Uh, you know, some people you have, they give you advice, and as soon as they say it, you just hate it for whatever reason, you know, it just bothers you, um, but every once in a while there's a kernel in there of something that, that is, is really good. I, as I said, you said, I like to hear it. I like to hear criticism. I like to hear how we could do it better. Um, I like for there to be the open dialogue about, uh, and I don't have as much as I should. I, I, I should do it more. So um, I, I, I welcome the unsolicited advice, but I do not think you should rule by consensus. You should not, because that, Disaster. yes. So now I'm supposed to thank you okay. and remind the audience Jody, that you'll be the signing books right. after the wrap. But it's, it's <laughs> really a pleasure, and uh, yeah. I learned and, a lot. Uh, <laughs> and thank you both. Thank this you. was fabulous. And you're just, you really are as wonderful as I said you were before we got started. God. Please feel free to stay to uh, uh, get the books and have them signed. And thank you all for joining us. Great.